right, so we are gonna play a game called Yup or Back Up, and this is thanks to Student Ministries. Um, and this is the summer edition. So normally the game is played by moving from one side of the room to the other, but we're not gonna make you guys do that. There's a lot of you, that would There's, be chaos. Yes, absolute so, chaos. But we do want you to be loud and use your thumbs to tell us, yup, you really like this activity, or back up, uh, no thank you, I no don't thanks. like this activity. So summer edition, let's get started. All right, going on a hike. Yep or back up? Mm. Yep. You like going on a hike? No, Brian? No hikes for you? No, it's too much. My too feet much. hurt. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, roller skating. I am going to say yeah. no to this one because I probably would hurt myself. I used to be a really good roller blader yeah. until I fell and broke my arm. So yeah. no more. No I would more. definitely hurt Maybe myself. Maybe it wasn't good in the first place. All right. Family vacation. This could be controversial who depending on who you're sitting with. Who wants to spend a whole vacation with their family? Family vacation? Milo, Lane, you guys had a lot of fun on family vacation, didn't you? All right. Gardening. We know someone Barry? for sure. Barry? Barry, stand up. Seven thumbs up, yeah, Barry. Yeah, Barry's got all of his thumbs up. All those green thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ooh, summer school. Yikes. Uh, no, thank you. Boo. No, thank you. Although, no, thank you. Although little George said yes, he loves yeah, summer George school. Yeah, George likes so summer school. He said that sure earlier. Not quite sure what's up with that. Watermelons. I learned a fun fact today that Marin hates watermelon. So Marin, Marin says it's just crunchy water. Yeah. So. Yeah. You're not wrong. Uh, slip and slide. I like a good slip and slide. It can be dangerous. Soap. They add soap. Dangerous, it's a little, depending a little on dangerous. the soap action. Yeah. No to the water slide, Snowden? No? Okay. Amusement park. Amusement park. Yeah. 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 Amusement parks are fun. Maybe as dangerous as a slip and slide. It could be. Potentially, depending Potentially. on which one you go to. Yeah, could yeah. be. Sunscreen. Yes. Carly Pratt saying yes. My wife's an esthetician and she's saying yes. Yes. Wear your sunscreen, everybody. Gotta wear sunscreen. Grant Gwaltney. All right, sleeping in all I, day. I have a question about this okay. one. What does all day constitute? Okay, is this 9 a.m.? For me, sleeping in is 9 a.m. because I can't sleep in noon? much Is much it just further. sleeping through a whole day? Yeah. I, I don't, don't know. I don't think That's I could do that. a weird one. I know my husband could. He, sleep, he could sleep all day. Uh, s'mores. All right, who has had a s'more so far this summer already? Yeah? Yeah. Love s'mores? Brian, you had a question earlier about yeah, s'mores. Yeah, uh, Reese cups or chocolate on your s'more? Reese's. Oh. Reese's. Reese's. So much better. If yes. you never tried it, so much better. The McClure clan would say to not use graham crackers, but instead use saltines. Interesting. Saltines. I don't know. Interesting. All right. Chilling in a hammock. Who An likes Eno? to chill in a hammock? And yeah. An Eno. Pretty fun. I like Eno that. Eno That's a thing. Good. Lane had a really fun time on vacation in the hammock. He just swung in it. I was having a really hard time getting out of hammocks. Yeah. Going to a baseball game. The Indians games are really fun. I know baseball yeah. can be controversial. People either love yeah. it or hate it. So. Well, they have good food down yeah. in Victory Field now, so. Yeah, that's you true. Know. Backyard, Backyard barbecues barbecue. in which you put your bun on the grill. You put your entire. The full, the full thing on the grill. Your entire cheeseburger according on to the that grill. Picture. Yeah. Um, I like a good barbecue. To me, the answer depends on who's grilling. Yeah. Yeah. Reading for fun. I Reading love for to fun. read for like fun. Reading for fun? like to read? Book club. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No? Ugh. All right, last one, bike rides. Who likes to go on bike rides? I love a good bike ride. Tim likes to ride his bike. Danny's giving a face like, not sure. Uh, yeah. It, it is yeah, a lot of cardio. Hurt. Yeah, yeah. It is. All righty, well, um, we are in our fourth week of our Summerfest yeah. series, so I am going to go ahead and um, welcome Tim Ayers up to the stage. I'm gonna answer some big questions. Yeah. preach after that. Come on, guys. How do you, hey, uh, I, get, I get two, an, two questions today to answer, and they're really good ones, but I have to also tell you this. They aren't as fun as berries have been. I mean, heck, you got, do my pets go to heaven and are there dinosaurs in the Bible? Me, Tim, what do I get? I get a really important question, and I'm glad that somebody answered it, but here's my first question. If Jesus forgave my sins, why do I still sin? 
pretty serious, pretty serious. And I don't, I don't know who ans- asked this question, what kid, a- it's a, these are kids' questions. I don't know who asked it, but I just want to tell whoever you are that asked this question, I'm pretty sure that you aren't alone in wondering this. I'm thinking that everybody that's ever, that has followed Jesus wonders about the same thing from time to time. I know that I have. It's a great question, and it needs an answer. So here we go. Okay, the first thing that we need to talk about is what the Bible means when we see the word sin. And I think most people know there are things that we shouldn't be doing that we call sin. But the truth is that both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the words that, in both of those, the words that we now translate as sin, it's a kata in the Old Testament Hebrew and it's hamartia in the New Testament Greek. They were both words in both of those cultures that meant to miss the mark. Miss the mark as in archery. They were originally words that came from people shooting arrows and missing a target. Now, we, I know that we can't be shooting arrows in here this morning, but, um, and um, Brian said we'd have chaos on that game. We may have chaos. Can I have my targets, please? <laughs> Barry talked about dinosaurs, so Tim went out and got dinosaurs. Where's the... <laughs> here we go. And we need kids that want to throw one shot and see if they can hit the bullseye. Any kids that come on up and we got, you're going to get one throw, one throw because we may have so many kids, but let's see how they do on bullseyes here. Oh, they should stick. Oh, here, you want to give that? Yeah, just Whoa, that was a perfect throw over here, but it didn't stay. It's this last one. Oh! Well, let's give him a hand. I'm going to have to write to the manufacturer about their sticking things, I think. Well, so to sin means this. We know what we should be doing, and what we should be saying, and what we should be thinking. We know what hitting the mark is, but what we do is something that misses that mark. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came, hitting a bullseye or living a life that was right on target meant living by the rules that God had given to the Jewish people, and these were rules that begin with what we call the Ten Commandments. And God gave the Jewish people the Ten Commandments, or what we sometimes call the law, so they would know what a bullseye looked like. And some of the rules that made up a bullseye life were not lying and not murdering and not stealing anything and not saying untrue evil things about other people. But here's the rub. In all of this, it's that God also made every single person that has ever lived from the very first people right up to today, God made it so that every person gets to choose whether they're going to do the right thing or not do the right thing. We all get to decide if we're going to hit the bullseye in life and do what is right, or if we're going to not do what we know is right and miss that mark. We are not robots. We weren't made in a way that we have to do the right things or that we have to do the wrong things. God lets us choose what we do and say, and and that's great, you see. You see, that's really good. But what also comes with getting to decide what you do or what you say or what you think is this. When you miss the mark, 
when you live in ways that don't hit that bullseye that God tells us about in life, you also have to take the responsibility. You have to take the responsibility for doing the wrong things. And God has said there are consequences. There are consequences for not hitting the mark. If I lie, there are consequences when I get caught. If you steal something and get caught, you still have to take the punishment for stealing. You chose to do it. So while it's great that we get to decide what we do and think and say and all that, we have to remember that God also said that we are responsible for the times when we miss the bullseye. Now when Jesus came, He lived a perfect bullseye life. He never did or said or thought anything that wasn't exactly what God wanted people to do and say and think. And then Jesus did something that only He could do, even though He never missed the mark. He chose to take the blame for the times that you and I do miss the mark. Jesus said, I will take all the responsibility for all the lying and the stealing and all of the other things that people do in life. And that's what Jesus was doing when He died on the cross. He was taking the responsibility for all of us when we miss the mark. And Jesus doing this made it possible for us to be forgiven. In fact, God now says this to us when we choose to follow Jesus. He says, I've forgiven you because of what my son did. And when we see each other in your next life, I'll have forgotten all about all the times that you missed the mark. But here's something we should always keep in mind. Just because we've chosen to follow Jesus, while we are still in this life, God still lets us make our own choices. We still get to choose what we say and what we do and what we think. And God, He does give us His Spirit to help us make better decisions. Boy, am I really thankful for that. But while we are still in this life, we still get to choose to do the right things like Jesus always did, or well, the wrong things. And so, as sad as it sounds, there will always be times, there just will be, guys, when we give in to the temptation to do the wrong things, and we still miss the mark. Now, I'm sure that some of you are thinking, but it seems like I'm always doing the wrong things. Or maybe you're th thinking, my brother always does the wrong things. Or you're comparing yourself to someone else who looks like they never miss the mark. Well, I want you to know something. There are a whole bunch of books in the Bible that were written by a guy we now call St. Paul. And I'm just saying, if you get a book in the Bible and people are calling you officially a saint, you probably lived an almost perfect life, wouldn't you think? But I want to read to you what that guy, St. Paul, wrote in one of his letters, and it's in the Bible, no less. Listen to this. It says, I know that all of God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. I'm so full of myself, what I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way and then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that I need help. I know the law, the Ten Commandments. He says, I know the law, but still can't keep it. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I do, I can want to do it. But I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, and then I do it anyway. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus has set things right for me. And I'm just saying, if St. 
Paul said this, that he missed the mark all the time, we shouldn't be surprised at all, even knowing that God has forgiven our sins, that sometimes we will still be tempted to do things that are wrong and will, guess what? We'll just miss the mark. Yes, I know it can make us feel badly, especially when we give in to temptation to do things we know are wrong. But here is what we, what we, here is what we must always remember. When we finally do meet God face to face in the next life, Jesus will be there. And you can count on it that this is what he's going to say to you. Don't worry. I've taken care of everything for you. So even though we all still sin from time to time and don't always live in the ways that we should, we can rest in this truth. Jesus has made it possible for everything we've ever done or said or thought that misses the mark to be forgiven. And he's also made it possible for anything that we will do in the future that doesn't hit the mark to be forgiven. And I promise you, even though you will sometimes miss the mark, God, who calls himself your good heavenly Father, he will welcome you into your new life with him when that day comes. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you that your son took the ultimate punishment for our sin. Father, please help us to listen to your Spirit's voice when he urges us to be obedient to what you've told us to do and to live in the way that shows the world that we are your children. But Father, I am so thankful that we can be confident of your love and that it is without measure towards us. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. What was the time you got in trouble? I accidentally spilled the water on the table. I was sitting on the couch and then my mom told me to go to my room. But then I didn't go and then my mom got mad. Uh, my mom and dad didn't tell me to share something so I didn't share it. For hitting miles. What helps you remember to do the right thing? Uh, Jesus. My mom and dad. Mom and dad. Certain. What's the nicest thing someone has done for you? Like when um, someone pushed me down and then someone checked on me. Clean my room. Who cleans your room? My mom. Help me make my bed. What is the nicest thing you've ever done for somebody else? Clean my sister's room. Me, me and my sister wanted like, the same drink, and I said we can share. I made her breakfast two times in a row. Um, like when someone fell off the balance beam at school, and then I helped them back up. How did Jesus save the world? How did Jesus save the world? Well, I love this question, and here's why. The way most people talk about Jesus is that he came to the earth to save people, just people. And then he saves us so that when we die, we get to go away from this earth, away from this world, and go to a new home up in heaven so we don't have to have anything else to do with this broken planet ever again. And that's the way we tend to talk about it. And I understand why it sounds wonderful to go someplace away from all the trouble here on the earth, but the reason I like this question is there are two important words in that question. Uh, Jesus, how did Jesus save the world? And the two important words are the world. You see, when the Bible says the world, as in God so loved the world, 
so much that he gave his only son, Jesus, to save it, usually, not always, now I'm going to say not always, but usually in the vast majority of times that we see the phrase, the world, in the Bible, the author is talking about everything in the entire creation. People, yes, God loved people. He loves people. But God also loves the earth, and he loves the earth's animals, and he loves the earth's plants, and he loves the stars. He loves the whole universe that he created. So when the Bible says God loved the world so much that he sent Jesus to save it, it's actually talking about God loving everything that he created. That's what we're really talking about when we say, say Jesus saved the world. And to answer this question, we have to start with the very first story in the Bible, the story about God creating the world. And in this story, God says that all the things that he created were good, good. What that word meant, and what we should feel when we see that God said the world was good is this. It meant it means that everything that God created did exactly what it was supposed to do in the very best way possible. I'm going to read that again. For something to be called good meant it did exactly what it was created to do in the best possible way. The animals were good because they did it. All the stuff they did was exactly what God created them to do, and the plants were good because they did exactly what God created them to do, and the stars, the same thing with the stars, the same thing with everything that God created. And what we see at the end of the creation story is that since everything was doing exactly what God created it to do, God didn't just say the world was good. He said it was very good. He doubled down on that one. This thing is working. Everything was just right. And guess what? It was just right to put us in it so we could live the best life with one another and with him. But the creation story also tells us this, that God gave people, us, the responsibility for caring for everything on the earth in ways that made it possible for everything to continually do what it was created to do. But here's the sad part of the story. The only part of God's creation that chose not to do what God made it to do were people. That's what the story of Adam and Eve tells us. And when they chose not to do what God had created them to do, when they chose to disobey God, it not only broke their relationship with God and with one another, but it also broke the entire good system of the world. And sadly, and this is a hard statement to say, but nothing in the creation now does exactly what God created it to do. Nothing. Now, I know this doesn't seem fair. It seems harsh to me that everything in God's creation had to pay for people choosing to disobey God. But from all that we can tell, when people started choosing to do what they wanted to do instead of what God created them to do, the entire world began to break down. And so when we say that Jesus saved the world, we're really talking about Jesus making it possible that someday the entire creation is going to go back to the way that God initially intended it to be. People will live like God intended us to live, and animals will live like God intended them to live, and the plants and the weather and everything will live exactly as God intended that, them to live. Now, I know this sounds almost impossible, but it's true. It's also true that almost every picture that the Bible gives us of that coming kingdom the coming kingdom of God, what it will be like, it, and how it involves new life, it almost, it almost always includes not just people, but the entire creation. In fact, that same St. Paul guy that I talked about earlier, he wrote some amazing things about this. 
Listen to what he said. He said, the created world itself can hardly wait for what's coming next. When people finally live like they were supposed to live again, everything in creation is being more or less held back. God is reining it in. All creation and all the creatures are ready to be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. Paul said that the creation is waiting in great anticipation for, for the day when God finally steps in and makes certain that his entire world goes back to living the way he created it to be. In fact, almost every description of the day when the world gets saved and goes back to living the way God intended it to live involves more than just people listen to this description. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion and the little and a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. A baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in the nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. I can hardly wait. God's promise is that someday he'll make all things new. All things Just think, everything in the world will be given new life. And this will happen someday because Jesus saved the world. When Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead to new life, it made it possible for the entire broken world to someday once again live just as God intended everything to live. And that means people, you and me, but that also means the animals and the trees and the whole, the whole, everything. Everything, the whole world has the promise of new life because Jesus saved the world. He lived as God wanted us all to live. And then he died for us on a cross. And then he rose again from the dead. And guess what that means? That means it has made it possible for us to be certain that someday we will all live in a world where everything has been saved. I think that's worth living for. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you, thank you for what your son has done for us. But Father, I pray we never forget the cost of saving the world. Your son giving his life to set us free, free from sin and death. Thank you, thank you. May we be a people who live in the continual awareness that it is because of Jesus that we have the promise of a saved world new life as you planned it to be, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church, and the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.